Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Joining me tonight is Richard Lee Byers, author of over 40 fantasy and horror novels, including 16 set in the Forgotten Realms universe. Thanks for joining us, Richard. Oh, my pleasure. Now, Richard is the author of The Reaver, the upcoming fourth book in the multi-author Sundering series published by Wizards of the Coast. I've read The Reaver. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, Richard, would you like to give us a brief overview of the novel? Uh, the novel is part of the Sundering sequence, which means that there is a great uh, cosmic change that is affecting all of the Forgotten Realms. Uh, my book focuses on what's going on around the uh, Sea of Fallen Stars, where uh, a perpetual rain is uh, making life very hard for all the people there, producing flooding, crop failure, all kinds of problems. In that uh, background, there are uh, two religions competing for the uh, allegiance of the people, kind of saying, you know, follow our way, and it's the way out of this terrible situation. One is the religion of Umberly, who's an evil goddess of the sea, and one is uh, the religion of uh, Lathander, who's the god of the dawn and new beginnings, who has been uh, missing in action in the Forgotten Realms for a hundred years. And each of those gods has... Uh, uh, a chosen a particular agent in the in the region who is promoting uh, promoting the faith and a uh, an infamous pirate named uh, Anton Maravaldi gets caught up in that uh, conflict and although he initially looks like a very unlikely sort of uh, champion since he doesn't really care about anything but his own uh, pleasure and his own enrichment becomes uh, instrumental to deciding which way things are going to go. Now, one thing that struck me immediately from the beginning was this this character, this pirate, Anton. You described him early on very well, and you characterized him as someone with virtually no moral compass. He is, he is ruthless. He is very much a reaver uh, through and through. And yet, I found myself right away cheering him on, and I, I'd like to consider myself a good person, but... Here's this this character that is, you know, arguably committing these these pretty awful acts, and yet I'm sympathizing with him. Now, what what stylistic devices, uh, if any, did you employ to get me to sympathize with this pirate? Well, I put it, you know, I put you in his head as a viewpoint character, which is uh, always a way to get the reader to empathize with a particular uh, character. Uh, although he has all the bad qualities you mentioned, he has some uh, some good qualities, and you know they're qualities that those of us who love adventure fiction, you know, tend to admire quite a bit. He's bold, he's decisive, he's resourceful, he's a master swordsman. Uh, he leads from the front. He doesn't ask anybody to take any chances that he isn't taking himself. So you know, as adventure readers, we dig all that. Uh, I also. Pretty early on in the story, um, you know, put him in a hole, put him in very ad adverse circumstances. And that's certainly a way to get uh, get the readers to uh, empathize with a particular character. And uh, and then not too long after that, you start seeing that uh, despite himself, he has some deeply buried qual good qu other good qualities more that start to uh, emerge. And the, the character you mentioned previously, Stead, the child, clearly had some impact on, on Anton, and their relation throughout the novel develops in such a way as to, to reveal more of Anton's, I suppose, hidden character. Do you want to speak more to that interrelationship and the, the conflict, that great conflict that it arose between the two of them? Well, I don't want to give away too much of the book, but... Um... Stead is the chosen of Lathander, which essentially means he's the uh, embodiment of hope and the uh, ch chance for a fresh start. And kind of by virtue of you know his apparent goodness and willingness to uh, willingness to take chances in the service of the good, and his unselfishness and his persistent tendency to. Uh, see the potential for good at Anton even early on when Anton absolutely doesn't recognize it in himself, that, that all kind of nudges uh, Anton in the right direction. And now we meet a second or another main character a little later on, Umara. Uh, if, if you'd rather avoid spoilers, we don't have to talk too much about her, but 
Well, one, she's in the first chapter. It's, you know, so we'll all right. <laughs> Great. So you know, one thing I notice about Umara and Anton is they are superficially very dissimilar. And yet they actually share quite a bit in common. And maybe this comes out a little bit more as we get to know them better. But do you want to maybe speak a bit about Umara and any similarities or dissimilarities between her and Anton? She's a red wizard of Thay who I've written a lot about the red wizards of Thay. And, uh, and that means that she's part of a uh, part of a hierarchy of mages that uh, rule the uh, the. Uh, evil realm of Thay, and, uh, but as Thay has developed uh, in the last hundred years, it's mainly a uh, country ruled by evil undead mages, and she is not undead. So she finds herself, even though she's privileged compared to the average Thayan in kind of a subservient uh, position, and knows that really the only way that she becomes a true you know, a truly important person in the hierarchy is eventually to become undead herself, which she kind of innately recoils from. Uh, so that's that's uh, her conflict. The um, the way she and Anton are alike is they both uh, have things in their life that they uh, regret very much, but uh, they don't. Re- neither one of them starts out seeing any potential for a fresh start. Each of them at the beginning of the book is saying, "Well." This is my life. These are my circumstances. I'm going to make the best of them as opposed to I'm going to change them. Now, you mentioned the word conflict there, and I think inner conflict is a big part of the story as well as outer conflict. And I've always held that conflict really is the the heart of storytelling. And I really love that there's so many sides to the conflict going on within this story. It's not just two sides. It's multiple sides converging. Their stories intertwine. Um, a lot of it revolves around capturing Stead. You can you can speak to that, right? That's yeah, well, spoilers. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'll, the, the whole a whole bunch of the uh, first part of the book is all about you know Stead being captured, you know Stead being escaping, Stead being rescued. But it turns out that the people that rescue him really want to capture him and exploit him for themselves. I mean, that's the that's a big part of the story, right? All almost all the way through until uh, until we get to uh, Sapra and, and and find out what his great mission that was taking him east that he doesn't really know himself he just knows he has to go uh, what that is and and then then the character of the story changes a little bit but but certainly the beginning is you know Stead is the uh, you know everybody's chasing Stead he's trying to figure out how to stay free how to preach the gospel of Lathander so to speak without uh, becoming so high profile that it's easy for his enemies to grab him uh, how to get uh, to uh, Sopra and, and do what he's whatever it is he's supposed to do there uh, so yeah that's uh, that's certainly a big part of it people that like uh, you know chases and escapes and uh, that kind of thing we got plenty of them uh, I know you've been writing within this universe for a long time are you yourself a Dungeons and Dragons player yeah I've been playing it since it was three beige pamphlets and a white cardboard box <laughs> which, which means you know right when it uh, you know, right when it was first created, um, I remember finding it uh, in a hobby shop and, uh, you know, picking it up and never having heard of it, but picking it up on a whim. And that was really the best 10 bucks I ever spent. Wow. And did your experience with D&D influence your writing at all? You know, that's hard to say because I, I think not as much as some people might think because long before I was a D&D player, I was a fan of uh, sword and sorcery fiction. I'd already read, you know, Fritz Leiber and Robert E. Howard and Carl Edward Wagner and Jack Vance and, you know, all the great early masters of the form who inspired Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson to create D&D in the first place. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd, already, uh, I'd already been straight to the well. So I, I don't really think the game influenced my writing. Although certainly when I started writing Forgotten Realms Fiction, then I was writing about the game. Absolutely. And I believe your first novel was in the in that setting was published in the year 2000, uh, The Halls of Stormweather, right? Well, that was actually an uh, anthology. And I have one of the novelettes that are in the anthology. It was the first book in what was to become the Symbia series within the Forgotten Realms. 
And the way that worked was each of us semi writers did a novelette introducing the, our particular character, and then the novels that followed from that were each, you know, sta- a novel where we got to focus on the character that we had created. So my actual first Forgotten Realms novel is The Shattered Mask, which is about the same character you meet in Halls of Stormweather. So you're you're very much there ingrained within the Forgotten Realms. You know, you've you've left your your mark. I know that a lot of D and D veterans have grumbled a bit about changes to the setting made by Wizards of the Coast over the years, and now with this this great sundering, I'm sure some people are a little worried. Uh, given you're so deeply rooted in the Forgotten Realms, what is your impression of all this? Of sort of where Forgotten Realms is going, where it's been, uh, its past, its history. And you know what lies in store for the future. Well, I think that um, you know I think that we and by we I mean all of us writers and, and the company. You know we understand the reason for the big change that was made with the spell plague and the time jump, and it was to create um, new opportunities for uh, you know adventures and novels and stuff like that, and introduce some exciting new elements. And I think some of that worked really well. But I think everybody realizes that uh, along realizes after the fact that in the process of doing that, some of the elements that people really loved are uh, were lost temporarily, and and people really missed them. So one of the points of the sundering, you know, having another big cataclysm, is the you know this is kind of a fixed cataclysm in a way. We are um, well, that I don't can't go into specifics because I'll spoil the people's <laughs> including mine. But um, at the end of the centering, things that you were sorry to see leave the Forgotten Realms, there's a pretty good chance they'll be back. I mean, in the case of my book, it's, because it's not really spoiling anything to say that, um, you know, it's about the, the rebirth of the god Lathander, is who, you know, changed into the god Amanator at, at the time of the spell plague. And, you know, people, I think by and large, don't, like a Manator as much. I don't like a Manator as much. I literally like Lathander. So the Manator is out, Lathander's back. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff we're doing. Oh, fantastic. So then this is this is reassuring to the veterans. Sundering is good, right? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, at, at the end of the Sundering, the people that like the classic realms, it's going to look a lot more like that again. Great to hear. Now, one thing about the Sundering is um, that players themselves get to influence the setting in some manner. Is that right? That the their results and adventures can be submitted to Wizards of the Coast and will influence some of the stories in the novels. Obviously, not the ones that have already been written, but uh, can you speak to that? Well, yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, since I'm on the fiction end of things, I'm not real knowledgeable about that. But as, as I understand the basics is, you know, it's not going to influence anything you see in the novels. Uh, because that wasn't that wasn't practical. But the Sundering as an event actually extends beyond the novels. There are these adventures you could play, and and uh, like you said, submit your results. And Wizards is kind of you know I guess kind of averaging those out and see what what which were the most common results of, of in a you know in a particular adventure. And uh, those will be used to um, those will be used to define aspects of the realms going forward that the novels don't define. And, of course, there are a lot of them, because even though we told six big stories, you know, the realms is huge. So there's all kinds of stuff that the books don't touch on at all that can be defined by these various adventures. Right on. Now, this very much seems like a shift in the mentality of Wizards of the Coast and really getting the players actively involved, uh, especially, you know, with D&D Next. This is the first time doing that whole... Uh, beta and collecting the feedback and a lot more uh, external opinions shaping the future of Dungeons and Dragons. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a really intelligent thing to do. I mean, it's all about the, you know, the the, the players and in the case of the fiction, you know, the readers. If you aren't, uh, I mean, if you aren't pleasing them, then then what's the point? And uh, I mean, then gaming in particular is such an interactive thing anyway, and always has been. I mean, it only makes sense to uh, it only makes sense to be tapping into the uh, the ideas and and the experiences of, of of players on a on a certain level and making the best use of that information that you can. 
I mean, I was, beyond that, kind of one of the raps on Forgotten Realms as a gaming experience, and I'm not necessarily saying this that I agree with it, but um, but one of the things I've heard over the years is that you know the the players feel like they haven't their care the actions of their characters are not that significant compared to like the actions of the characters in the novels in terms of of shaping how the world goes forward this this is a you know this I've, I've never really agreed with that that much because you know like I said it's so huge you can have so many big adventures off separate from the big adventures that a character any characters any novels are having having but you know if there was any truth in it at all this should help with that because um, yeah you're gonna uh, you're gonna submit your results and that is gonna very directly affect what people see in subsequent Forgotten Realms products. In the case of my books, whatever that defines, then when I go to write a story about, uh, you know, the touches on that particular area or something, yeah, whatever happened, you'll see it reflected in my book. Is there, I don't know if you can talk about this, but is there any chance of any characters that appear within the Reaver being published as NPCs in a, either a source book or a, a campaign rule book one day? I haven't heard anything about that one way or the other. I think that would be very cool. I know that with each, um, I know that with each novel, there's supposed to be a miniature set that comes out. Uh, so you should you be, be able to get miniatures of the characters. As far as write-ups on the characters, I just haven't heard one way or the other. I do know that we've discussed, um, you know, the characters going forward in future novels. Nothing about that has been you know, finalized yet. So I can't like say, here's the title and here's the release date or something like that. <laughs> but, but we have talked about, and you having read the novel can, I'm sure could see pretty clearly where the setup is for the story to continue. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot to look forward to for the future. Yeah. I hope so. So just to shift gears a little bit, um, it's my understanding that you have a master's degree in psychology. Does this give you insight into writing more believable characters? Does it give you a greater understanding of how a character thinks, acts, interacts? You know, I think sometimes, uh, particularly if you're writing about uh, a character who has some kind of actual psychopathology, but I really think that it doesn't help as much as I expected it to going in. That was actually one of the reasons that... Um, I went into psychology. I thought, well, when I, you know, when I know all the psychology, then when I get around to writing my fiction, it, it'll be so helpful in terms of creating characters. And yet, kind of. But I really think now that what's much more important is just to kind of uh, have empathy and imagination. You know, you just kind of imagine the character, you know, with a particular set of circumstances that he came from, and then you. Just, you know, kind of crawl inside his skin and imagine how you would react if you had his predispositions that were facing the particular situation that he's facing. Now, I know that a lot of Dungeons & Dragons players, specifically Dungeon Masters, tend to be aspiring fiction writers. Would you have any advice for them to get started? Uh, I think that, um, well, you know, Robert A. Heinlein, the great science fiction writer, uh, gave... Uh, you know, gave the three basic pieces of writing advice with the three basic rules, which were you have to write, you really have to create stuff, you create stories, you have to finish those stories, and then you have to submit them uh, to markets over and over again until somebody buys them. And that's the most basic thing you can tell anybody. As far as, um, as, far as actually writing stuff, uh, it helps tremendously, I think, to have a, a writing schedule laid out and then stick to it. If I didn't know every week that, by God, I have to sit down at a certain time and write and, and you know, keep to that schedule, I'd never get anything done because I'd always find an excuse to do something else <laughs> if I just hadn't made myself be OCD about that. As far as getting stories finished, if you have a big problem with that, it helps a lot to uh, outline. Even if, you, um, even if you, you, know, you hate outlining, if you can't finish a story, outline stuff and... and, and, and and at least you'll kind of know where you're headed. Uh, as far as submitting uh, stuff to Marcus over and over again, that can be very bruising when when stories come back. But um, you know, you just have to man up and do it. And the thing that helps you um, most with coping with rejections, I think, is to already have another project underway that you're excited about. 
so that way the, the rejection of the earlier story doesn't hurt as much. And you should be uh, you should be doing that anyway because you know unless you're uh, unless you're uh, Margaret Mitchell and write Gone with the Wind, you know you got to write a <laughs> story anyway to have a writing career. So that's some basic stuff. Uh, beyond that, um, I think that you know if you're an aspiring fantasy writer, in addition to um, reading a bunch of fantasy, which you of course will have done anyway. It helps a lot to read other kinds of fiction because you'll find a lot of um, you'll find a lot of uh, tropes and tricks that you can uh, borrow that will uh, give your fiction some uh, distinction that sets it across from everybody else's fantasy stories if they only read Tolkien. You know, I've written a lot of stories that have uh, mystery elements that I, I can work with because I've read a lot of detective stories. I wrote a Forgotten Realms novel, which is also a spy novel. That helps. It also really helps to uh, read a lot of nonfiction. History is tremendously helpful if you're trying to write medieval fantasy. You'll get all kinds of details and depth that will um, add uh, add richness and, and to your work, even if you decide some of it's not applicable because, hey, you know, all the stuff about how hard to travel you know, doesn't wouldn't be applying my role because we've got easy teleportation. You know, <laughs> even even where those differences exist, there's still going to be so much you can use. So that's some stuff, some advice. Fantastic advice right there. And on the topic of historical accuracy and getting the details right, one thing I really noticed in your writing, when I was reading uh, the the fight scenes, Anton very frequently gets involved in sword fighting, and you handle these these scenes exceptionally and it did not surprise me to learn that you do have an interest in in fencing um and i appreciated that you edited yourself you did not use any technical jargon it is all understandable to the layman but it is clear that all the strokes he that anton is doing with his swings and his thrusts and his parries it's not someone just guessing at what sword fighting is it's clear that that you have a great understanding on that uh, do you want to speak to your interest in fencing and how it relates to your writing? Well, first I should thank the couple editors that kind of like kicked the more esoteric fencing terminology at, terminology out of my work over the years and told me you can't say that because people won't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, fencing helps a lot, has helped me a lot in terms of writing all this fight-heavy kind of fiction that I write. Modern fencing, of course, is... Uh, significantly different from uh you know fighting with real sharp weapons and really trying to kill the opponent you know that it's it, but still you know the basics are there you know the the thrust the cut the parry you know footwork all that stuff you know all that stuff is there so you can really um you really can get a sense of what's pop what's possible for your your characters and you know how a, a battle might unfold I actually think even when I'm not writing specifically a sword fight, that fencing has helped me quite a bit with my combat scenes because you gain, um, you know, you gain an understanding of basic uh, ideas like, uh, atta you know, attack and uh, blocking an attack and tricking the opponent and how changes in tempo, you know, can affect a fight. Things like that are actually applicable to any kind of close combat. So I guess uh, another piece of advice then would be to draw upon your own experiences and knowledge to enrich your writing. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. You got to. It really helps to know some stuff about something. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that 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 sounds like a duh comment, but uh, yeah, whatever you know, whatever you can learn that's either from a book or or firsthand that uh, that enhances your knowledge of the world is, is likely to come into your fiction and stuff like, you know, fencing is going to come into uh, your sword sorcery fiction in a very direct way, but anything. And also, of course, it also helps to have, um, it also helps to have friends whose brains you can pick. Um, you know, I don't know Jack about horses, but horses come into fantasy stories a lot. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got a, a friend who knows about horses and in a pinch I could, you know, go, you know, you know, you know, does a horse have a gear shift? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad I, I check, glad I checked that. As, same thing with botany. I don't know much at all about botany, but I have a friend who does. And when I want to talk about, uh, you know, when I want to talk about trees and flowers and stuff, I can always go talk to her. That's great. 
All right, well, that's uh, about our time. Uh, Richard, do you have any closing thoughts, any final message you'd like to share? Well, first, I hope everybody enjoys the book. Anybody that's interested in my uh, work can uh, look me up on uh, Amazon, and uh, you'll, you'll find all my stuff there. I've uh, got a uh, monthly opinion column I write for a, a science fiction news site called Airlock Alpha. You can always go there and find me uh, mouthing off for free if you want to read a little essay about something or other. I'm on uh, Google+, Plus. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and uh, I invite everybody to uh, connect with me there. And we'll be sure to get all of those links in the video description. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure. Oh, it's been great. I really enjoyed it. For those of you listening, The Reaver releases February 4th, retailing for $28. Check it out. It is a terrific read, not only for D&D players, but also for anyone who enjoys fantasy literature. And stay tuned for my upcoming review of The Reaver. 